FM in New York City, WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, DC. Here on We Only Want the World, we always put humanity first, never America first, and we look at the whole world, how it actually is and how it could be radically changed through an actual revolution. I'm a follower of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian. I'm a fighter for revolution, and I am so happy to be with you tonight. In these extraordinary, truly unprecedented times, we have a special program for you tonight, a round table with three extraordinary guests I'll introduce in just a moment. The theme that we're going to get into for the full hour this evening is this unprecedented, dangerous attempt to overturn the election being carried out right now by Donald Trump, by fascist Republicans in the Senate and Congress who tomorrow are using what is normally just a perfunctory formality of the certification of the election results that have already been- I've lost sound. We hear you, Andy. Um, <laughs> that have already been uh, certified. Um, they're turning this into a chance to disrupt that certification and overturn the election or, or make a, a, a attempt towards that. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has called into the streets of DC thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, maybe more of his most diehard, rabid, MAGA, fascist mobs and supporters who rampaged in the streets of DC last time they were there. This is all coming together in a very unprecedented move. And we're gonna talk about what is the danger we face and what must we do about it? So, oh, one more thing about this evening is we are doing a live broadcast of this program as well, this round table on the YouTube show, the Revolution Nothing Less show, the RNL show at youtube.com slash the Revcoms, which uh, it's a show I co host together with Andy, who is one of our guests tonight. So, with no further ado, let me bring you our uh, three guests who are going to be in this roundtable with us. I am very pleased to introduce first uh, Reverend William H. Lamar IV. He is the pastor at the Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C. It is the church, one of the churches. Uh, historic black church that was targeted intentionally by Trump supporters last time they were in town. Proud Boys assaulted his church, vandalized the church, tore down the Black Lives Matter banner. And he, among other things, wrote an extremely powerful op-ed in the Washington Post about this. Uh, Reverend Lamar, welcome to We Only Want the World. Thank you so much, and so a pleasure to be with you and uh, Doc and Andy. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Andy, can you hear me yet? It's a little uneven right now. I think they're trying to, to fix it now, but I obviously okay. heard you ask well, me let that me, question. Let me introduce you, then, I'll, then, I'll, then you can say what you have to say. Uh, Andy Z is the host of the Revolution Nothing Less show. He is a longtime friend and comrade, somebody I've learned a tremendous amount over many, many years now, um, learned a tremendous amount from. And he is also a co-initiator of refusefascism.org and a follower of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakin. Andy, welcome to We Only Want the World. Thank you, uh, Sansara. It's a real honor to uh, have a chance to meet virtually uh, uh, Reverend Lamar and, of course, to be with uh, Cornell, uh, our co-initiator of Refuse Fascism. And there we I'll, go. I'll put it back to him, a long-distance fighter for freedom. There you go. There you go. You did half my introduction for me. So okay. <laughs> finally, we have with us Dr. Cornell West, who it's a great joy to bring to the airwaves together with the other two guests. Um, he is an activist scholar, a revolutionary Christian, somebody who's been on the front lines and been in the prisons and is now on the podcast circuit with his podcast, The Tightrope. Cornell, Brother Cornell West, welcome to We Only Want the World. No, oh, my dear sister, it's always a blessing to be in your presence. You on the front line year after year after year after year and still strong. Brother Andy, it's always a blessing to see you and break bread with you and Brother Carl and Brother Vakian too. And Brother Lamar, representing the best of the prophetic black church. All right, so we are, we're in for a treat. If you are watching this online at the youtube.com uh, slash the rev comes, take a moment, spread this on social media, let other people know to come tune in and sit back, relax. We are, we're in for quite a conversation. I think to start us off um, with the dangers of this moment, I wanna ask you, Andy, if you could open us up. How do you see the dangers? I know you were able to prepare a little bit of your thinking on this. It'd be helpful to set some, the stage. Well, thank you, Sansara, and I'm, I'm really excited about the conversation. Look, the danger is fascism. What is fascism? It's vigilante shooting Black Lives Matter protesters. 
It's open white supremacy. It's refugees in concentration camps. It's paramilitary forces using violence to suppress dissent. It is lie upon lie such that the very concept of what is real and what is true is destroyed. It is outright theocrats dominating the courts. It is the brazen, open attempt to overturn the election of Biden to the presidency. It is the shredding of even the pretense of democracy. An attempted coup that has been threatened for months and which is now in its showdown in Congress and in the streets of DC has life and death consequence. This is true whether it succeeds or fails. The, the result of that is not yet in. Refuse fascism has said that fascism is not just a gross combination of horrific reactionary policies. It is a qualitative change in how society is governed. Fascism foments and relies on xenophobic nationalism, racism, misogyny, and the aggressive reinstitution of oppressive traditional values. Fascist mobs and threats of violence are threatened and unleashed to build the movement and to consolidate its power. And we have seen this unfold, Sansara, over four years. And now with Trump's electoral defeat, all the pus that is routinely spewed from this malignant boil of Trump and Pence has burst into the most glaring view in their bid to overturn the election. This has serious consequence, not just for the people of this country, but for humanity. The danger is all the more acute because there is no mass and massive resistance and repudiation of all of this. The Biden Democratic Party essentially says, what me worry, Biden will be president on January 20th. They are telling the hundreds of millions who voted to end the Trump-Pence regime, if you protest, if we engage Trump, that's just giving him what he wants. No, as a member of the Refuse Fascism editorial board wrote, quote, they are forgetting the lesson of World War II. Ignore fascists and they will just go away. And we will never forget the cost of that folly. We have to understand that there are tens of millions of people who have been led, organized, and shaped in a fascist direction with their own media, their own schools, their own institutions for over 40 years to view themselves as the, quote, real America, and who have been conditioned to view a whole section of this country as alien, illegitimate, and undeserving of a voice. And they are blatant about who that is. Black people, other minority people, independent women, people who do not adhere to traditional gender norms, secular people, and people who just want a just world and do not think America is always right. There are two completely different views of how to cohere this country that have no middle ground. Trump's coup attempt shines a glaring spotlight on the reality that their attempt to overturn this election is in the service of bringing a neo-confederacy to power. It is not without content that this fascist movement has continued to invoke civil war. The confederacy of slavery in a modern day advanced imperialist America would be a fascist, fully apartheid, more aggressively genocidal America. Look, it is not impossible even if it is still very unlikely that Trump's, Trump's attempted coup will actually succeed in the short run. He has a very narrow and steep path, but it is not over and we must be vigilant and masses of people must be prepared and be preparing to act should this attempt gain initiative towards succeeding over the next couple of days. But even failed coups do real and lasting damage, including that they can come back and assume power with or without Trump. And this would be catastrophic for humanity. The Trump-Pence regime has already done incalculable damage. To stay in power through the means of overturning an election would be crossing a threshold of a society you don't even want to have to think about, but you need to. Even if they fail, they will have created what our website, Revcom.us, has called a fascist battering ram for the whole next period. This would be made up of a block of elected officials who view and act as if the Biden administration is illegitimate, and millions of people will support them. And this is important, they will have an armed street fighting force on call to dominate the public square. 
This would accelerate and cement a suppression of black votes and black peoples and other minority rights generally on a whole other level. Next, the Christian fascist movement that has been organized, been the organized core of the Trump-Pence regime and now seems to be divided over whether Trump's brazen coup is the best way for them to achieve their goal of a Christian fascist white supremacist America would fall in line should Trump succeed, further cementing the anti-women, anti-LBGTQ agenda that they have. And last, and already it must be said that tremendous damage has been done to the very concept of truth and science without which humanity is at the mercy of being manipulated by whatever the demagogue and his compliant media says is true. I had the biggest inaugural crowd will be quaint compared to what the world will be forced to accept. So with these remarks, I look forward to getting more deeply into this and, and then to discussing what it is we have to do to move forward. So thank you, Cornell, and Reverend Lamar, and Sansara. Well, thank you for that, Andy. Um, Reverend Lamar, I'd like to bring you into the discussion. Uh, for those of you who are listening on the radio, you have no idea how handsome Reverend Lamar's shirt is. You should know. Um, if you want to, uh, it's true, His right, Cornell? That's, That's true. That's true. Okay. <laughs> Very true, very true, very true. Um, but I saw you, you were very responsive as Andy was speaking. I, I would love it if you could build on what he said, respond to what he said, but also, you know, if you have differences of any kind that you want to bring in as well, perhaps you could touch on what the impact of these Proud Boys coming to your church and how that, how you see that fitting in. Thank you very much. The shirt came out of uh, Dr. West's closet and uh, the, the old <laughs> It's like the 1995 Cadillac Fleetwood Brougham that I drove that my mama hated. I got that out of your garage. You know that too. <laughs> I'm glad I brought I it up. It. I love it. It's still playing Luther Vandross, but go on, go on. Uh, let, let me begin by, by saying that I think one of the things we lose in our so-called media and our discussions of events such as the one that we're talking about is historical context. So people speak of the Proud Boys as if they are surprised by their existence. It is because uh, we no longer remember the Aryan Nation, the White League, the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council. They are of a piece with a long line of white vigilante groups, fascist groups, who step up whenever human beings, particularly Black folks, Native folks, LGBTQIA folks assert their humanity and call America to task for its aspirational democracy. I'm very clear that what you have in the United States is an aspirational democracy in some places, but it's very difficult to call a democracy uh, the political economy in which we find ourselves where there's rampant voter suppression, uh, where there is pornographic wealth inequality. Uh, these things uh, mitigate against any type of real democratic ordering of our society. And so I think about the work of Ida Wells who helped us to understand that white violence was about economic envy, uh, that white violence uh, was also sexualized. It was a means to demean and to humanize. And when they came to our church, what was clear to me is it was also an ancestral assault, an assault to against what Metropolitan stands for. So if you read the documents about the founding of our church, Daniel Payne and others, they were clear that we want to build a church five or six blocks from the White House and the architecture of the space, the beauty of the space, the grandeur of the space is an assertion of our humanity. And it is it also, in my opinion, what Daniel Payne and others were doing was making sure that when I became the pastor in 2014, that I would understand that my theology, my rhetoric and my ethics must mitigate against American imperial violence. Everything we say, everything we do must embody the fact that we can live together in a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-faith reality. And so when I take that and compare that with what 
Andy's already said about what's going on with the lawlessness around the current occupant of the White House. I mean, let's, let's just be very clear that the party he represents, uh, he is not the first anti-democratic uh, person in the, in, in, the, in the Republican Party. For the last number of years, they have innovated ways through gerrymandering. They have innovated ways through new forms of suppression to keep people's voices from being heard. The last thing that I will say is today, we replaced our Black Lives Matter sign. It is bigger and blacker than the one that they took down. And like the great poet Sterling uh, uh, Brown said, we're gonna keep coming. They keep coming with hate. We keep coming with love. And I think what I really hope in a revolutionary sense, they will understand that the liberty and the freedom and the justice that we are about embraces them. That it is the society we seek to build would not exclude them. And that they are avatars for a political reality that excludes them. And as uh, we hear a lot of political scientists saying, this whiteness brings them into political concord with those who do things that are mitigate against their flourishing. And so there's a lot of work for us to do. And I'm really thrilled to be with you all this evening. Well, thank you for that, um, Bill. I wanted to just note something that moved me a great deal when I learned about your church and its history, and you spoke of this as an ancestral assault as well, that your church was the home to Frederick Douglass. Am I correct? Well, Mr. Douglass was not a member, but he was frequently in attendance. Okay. And like many of uh, persons of African descent, when Metropolitan was completed, they were taken by the fact that we built something so magnificent in the 1880s. It was built by many persons who had been enslaved. And so he visited, he gave one of his last orations from our pulpit and he was buried uh, from our church. Okay, well, thank you. That's really important. It's very yeah. important history to stand on too. Um, Brother Cornell West, I would love to bring your voice in here. What do you, how do you see, what do you wanna to add to this dis discussion so far and the danger in the moment that we're facing? One, I just wanna begin by saying how blessed I am to be in conversation with each and every one of you. I don't think that uh, people fully understand the impact of those who are willing to be courageous and cut against the grain. Uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party, uh, uh, founded, led by my dear brother, Bob Ovakian. No matter what political and ideological differences I might have, my deep love for him and you all in terms of your focus on what my Bible calls the least of these. Mm -hmm. Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth, their preciousness, their humanity sitting at the center of the vision of the Revolutionary Communist Party in terms of your critique and resistance. And we, we, we wrestle with Brother Andy and my dear brother Carl Dix. I've been to jail many times. I go to jail anytime that brother wants to go to jail along with some sorry and no chair and the other. Brother Andy as well. We will but, be there. Uh, but I just, I, I just wanted to just stop just for a moment for people to see what happens when someone catches on fire, falls in love with poor and working people like Brother Avakian and never sells out, never sells his soul. It's consistent decade after decade after decade after decade for the Black Panther Party to 2020. That's a rare thing. People need to take note of that. Young people need to acknowledge that. That's not something that you do by means of osmosis. You have to have fundamental commitment and dedication to the hell and suffering and social misery of poor and working people. And he has held up that bloodstained banner. So I wanna just begin with that because it seems to me that if, if we focus on the ways in which the predatory capitalism the ways in which it's tied to white supremacy and male supremacy, linked to militarism ab 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 abroad, driven by imperial forces, grounded in predatory capitalism, then we began to see what we're really up against. The spiritual decay, the moral decrepitude, the attempt to, 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 to continually intimidate folk 
Why don't we have masses resisting in the street? At Charlottesville, Charlottesville can bring 21 right wing neo-fascist groups together. We ought to have 35. And we have to raise the question, why is it that we don't have masses in that regard? And part of it is the very system that the right wing is trying to call into question is itself decrepit because we can't defend a system that is crushing folk and say that somehow their attempt to overthrow it is, uh, uh, is, 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 well, what would be the right language here? Their attempt to overthrow it doesn't warrant an analysis of the system itself rather than the smaller forces that are trying to do it. And what I mean by smaller forces is big money, Wall Street, big military, war profiteers that are sucking the wealth out of the economy. And you end up with these disoriented, confused, xenophobic, deeply patriarchal folk grasping for straws. They're the ones hitting the street, right wing activists. Where are our left wing activists? Where are our revolutionaries? Where are our radical reformers? That's the question that we need to raise, it seems to me, because I tell you that uh, we felt this in Charlottesville. And we looked around and saw, you know, thousands of folk with masks and shot with guns with, with ammunition in them. And here we got let 22 pastors singing this little light of mine, and I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> This, you know, that's a keep sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. <laughs> we need, we got to have a balance of masses of people in the street willing to go to jail, willing to die, whatever it takes to stand up for the dignity of working and poor people. And that's exactly what the history of the best of AME Church. That's the history of the best of the Black freedom struggle. That's Martin. That's Malcolm. That's Ella Baker. That's. Fannie Lou Hamer. That's the kind of spirit that we need. Well, I hear you on that. You are listening to, that was the voice of Dr. Cornell West. I'm also joined by Reverend William H. Lamar IV of the AME Metropolitan Church in Washington, D.C., and Andy Z, who is the host of the Revolution Nothing Less show, among other things, each of them. Uh, you're listening to We Only Want the World here on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York City and WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, D.C. We're also live broadcasting on the RevComs YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash the RevComs. I want to pick up on what you just, one of the things that you just said, uh, Cornell, and pose this to everyone, yourself included, Andy and Reverend Lamar. Why is it? How should we understand and what should we do about the fact that by any measure, the white supremacist mega fascist mobs are dominating the streets in the public discourse. They're setting terms. And, and it's not that there's no, no one who disagrees. We know there are people who disagree. We've seen them in the streets over the last four years. We've seen them at different points. One time, one day protests, women's march or a march against child separation, important things, but they didn't, they didn't have the... Um, uh, they were short-lived. They didn't have the persistence that's required. So, so why is it, and what do we do about the fact that we have a situation, I think the poet Yates said, the worst are filled with passionate intensity and the best lack all conviction. I thought the Brother West, you posed it well. I'd like to pose that back. Um, maybe we'll switch the order this time. Reverend Lamar, do you have thoughts on that? I do think, and this was the, the purpose of the op-ed that I, that I was trying to communicate, is that the narrative that powers the mythology, the capitalism, the kleptocratic capitalism, the continued white settler mentality. So if you, if you think about it, the impulse that God gives you the right to come to another's land to take that land, to take persons to work that land, to steal the wealth that is garnered from that labor. I mean, it, it, to me, I see it as, as unbroken. What happened at Metropolitan is that same white settler mentality, which has not been interrupted by a sustained narrative 
that says that that is now how that is not how we ought to live. The same thing with extraction capitalism. That is a, a piece uh, with plantation capitalism. Right? You don't have to pay people. You don't have to take care of people. You don't have to find a way for us to live together. Although that itself has its own struggle. And so for me, I think that it's not. It, it, I see it as them controlling the narrative, but I also see it as we have to continue to tell the story, to offer a different narrative, a different myth by which we can organize this space. I mean, we are, we are fighting a battle against a myth that has been preached from American pulpits, that has been taught in American history classes, and there has been no sustained interruption of the myth. And whenever, uh, because the people organize and push us in the direction of what is right, of what is democratic. So you look at the Voting Rights Act of 1965, before the ink dries, people are trying to figure out how to take away that progress, right? So you get the Roberts Court gutting preclearance. But we have to be very clear that that narrative is strong, that people are often unwilling to turn their backs on it. And so when you speak of Brother West as a revolutionary Christian, that means from our pulpits, that means in our theological discourse, we must offer a different view of what it means to live together. And so I, I, what I firmly believe, and I'll stop here, that mainstream media does not interrupt the myth. The New York Times doesn't interrupt it enough. MSNBC doesn't interrupt it enough. I, I really think the American church, black and white, has been bought and sold by that myth. A very important book to read, if you haven't read, is Kevin Cruz's book, one Nation Under God, where he talks about the fact that Christian America was designed by corporate America. It was designed to wed capitalism and Christianity, two things that don't go together easily at all, if at all. They found a way because they realized the only way for them to sell the kind of accumulation of wealth that they needed, they needed a theological staff. They needed God language. And so they merge two myths. And what I think we have to do is be as strategic and understand this, that our political achievements will never outrun the myth. The myth always undo, uh, it undoes, as a matter of course, the gains that we make. Uh, it's, it's some, some folks that study culture say that vision is always eaten alive by culture. And the vision that we have the myth is designed to keep it from taking root. And so we have to continue to tell our story and to show people that this is possible for us to live together in a different way. And that's what animates me. Andy? Well, there's a lot, on, there's a, there's a lot that's been raised that's very, that's very important, in, uh, including that the founding myth of America is something that has been perpetrated as, uh, you know, it is, it is the foundational lie of America and it persists through each, you know, we can just trace it through the history, how it's evolved and how it stayed fundamentally the same. But I want to uh, come at this in terms of what do we do, or why do we have this problem of not having millions of people in the streets? I mean, it, it's just, a, it's astounding at some, on some levels. Uh, sometimes middle of the night, I wake up and I say, are, are you kidding? There's an actual coup going on and, and everybody's just sitting saying, I I'm really so tired of talking about Trump or, you know, this kind of triviality. But I want to go back to what Cornell said about the, uh, about Bob Avakian and, and, and what our, the party he's led has been about in terms of the least of these, of those at the bottom of society. You see, because th this will get to the answer, what Bob Avakian did with that belief that came early in his life, I mean, not as a little child, but as he grew up through the 1960s and became part of that struggle, as you referenced with the Black Panther Party, other groups and whatnot. When that struggle ebbed, when the revolutions were overturned in the Soviet Union and in China. Avakian alone went to figure out and to analyze what were the causes of that. The largest causes in the system itself, the capitalist imperialist system, but also in terms of looking at the strengths of those revolutions, but also the weaknesses. And what he's became convinced of and what his life has been and his work and why we call it the new communism 
has been about putting the science of revolution, the science of communism on a thoroughly and consistently scientific basis, which means looking at reality as it actually is. And as part of this, as part of this, discarding and, and in sense, uh, the, the whole notion of the ends justify the means, or that somebody because of who they are is a, possesses the truth, rather than the truth is simply true or not, and that we can learn from everyone, even as we don't lose our convictions that are based on, and our morality that is based on a scientific, which means in, on what the reality actually is. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Why are people out in the streets? Well, because in one sense, people have a, don't understand what gave rise to the 60s, what happened to the 60s, what happened to the previous eras of revolution, and you know, just I, I think that what we need is an actual understanding of the reality, and that would be telling the truth and not so much a competing narrative that's simply a narrative that we invent that tells the story we want to tell, which is not what, what you were saying, um, just to be clear. Just to be clear, it's not what I heard from uh, Reverend Lamar, but I'm just saying this is out there in, in society where uh, you have your truth, she has her truth, uh, they have their truth. No, there's one truth that comprehends all of that. Now, why is this so important right now? Because people are not looking at the actual reality that what you have is two forces in the two ruling class. Why the New York Times doesn't go where it needs to go? Why Biden won't go where he needs to go? Why even AOC won't go where she needs to go thoroughly, or Bernie for that matter, is because they won't look at the fact that it's not just a predatory capitalism, which it is predatory, but it's capitalism. It's capitalism that's the problem. It's a system that only functions by exploiting people and competing over that. This is what it is. And so it, that it gives rise to gangsterism and why we can watch, uh, you know, The Godfather, one of my favorite movies, is because it's actually a concentration of, of life under this system. It's why The Sopranos resonates with people because that's how the bigger society is. So to get free, to, 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 to do the things that we need to do for people to be inspired, they need to understand what it is they're fighting. And they need to be understanding where we could go, that humanity could get beyond this. Here's an irony that uh, Bob Avakian has pointed out to us several times, that in terms of these fascist forces, first, there can be no reconciling with them except on their terms under this system. But if you actually had a movement for, for a revolution, for a different society where you could meet the needs of all of society and protect the planet and all the species on it, ironically, these very people could be won over to that, some of them. And it probably has only come as a result of a big fight. And let's, not, let's be clear that they've, they've been hardened into a hardcore. But in, in that context, people can break. And we, I saw that in my lifetime, although I was fairly young in the 60s, but I did have the experience of seeing people who started out going, into Viet, going to Vietnam, volunteering to go because they wanted to fight the communists and came back and threw their medals on the steps of the Capitol. Because when there is a struggle for actual freedom and against a system that is predatory, then you can have the possibility of people tr radically transforming and a radically transformed society. And what's on us right now, including the next two days, is enabling enough people to see the damage that is being done by this attempted coup, and particularly should it start to succeed in a, in a real way of actually unseating the president-elect, uh, and, and see that they have that power and why they have the power should they act in, in concert with each other and in a nonviolent and sustained way. And that the idea that we're just going to go out and punch out fascists is not an idea that's going to actually win over the people who need to be won over. We have to do this in a way that can mobilize millions and millions of people, even as I do admire the courage and the, you know, of, of, of such people who do that. It's actually a, it's a foolhardy and harmful way to go at this question, and, and, it's, and people should be told that. But there's too much also in our society right now not telling people what we think. I mean, it just has to be said, that's not going to do what needs to be done. So, I mean, so maybe I'll stop there. I think in addition, so as Andy is saying, you have to tell a story that will pull people in our direction. But what people also need are ancestral lights. You need to know that there were people before you mm -hmm. who engaged in the beautiful struggle. So what happens also in our context is the erasure of the story of a Eugene Debs the erasure of the story of Fannie Lou Hamer. Clearly, 
erasing people who can show us from our lived past what a future, what future is possible. One quick anecdote and I'll stop. So Ernie Green worships at our church, one of the Little Rock Nine. Now he and those with him walked directly into the belly of the beast. And one day I asked him, you know, Brother Ernie, what happened? And he said he was in a history class and the professor in the history class, or actually high school, high school teacher lectured on slave revolts. He said he had never heard of a slave revolt as a teenager in Little Rock, Arkansas. Didn't know about Denmark Vesey, didn't know about the New Orleans revolt. And he said when he heard that story and the opportunity came for him to walk into the belly of the beast, he knew not only was it possible, but that he was mm -hmm. called to do it because a vision was cast that called him. So clearly those who control the information flow, they erase the opportunity for us to be acquainted with those who could lead us in a different direction. And I'll stop there. I think that's very important. I think, you know, there's a reason that history gets buried. It's not an accident. Um, Cornell. I know you you want to oh, get it's this. Just, it's just such a rich, rich conversation. I know then you, you we want you in too, though, Sankara. You got some deep insights as well here. But uh, no, I think that what, what brings Brother Ernie together with with, with Brother Ovakian and, and Brother Malcolm and Sister Fanny Lou, Brother Edward Zaid, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, Grace Boggs, they had backbone. They had commitment that allowed them to put themselves in situations of danger in order to bear witness to something greater than them. And you see what we have at this particular moment in a very, very uh, decaying capitalist civilization is a spiritual decay. And so we don't have enough people who really believe there's something bigger than their narcissistic egos or their careerist options or their own selfish opportunities so that they're willing to become well-adjusted to injustice and accommodating to an unjust status quo. Once that is pushed to the margin, then no matter what, you don't have enough folk who are willing to fight let alone with the sophisticated social analysis of capitalism and imperialism and so forth and so on, you see. And when the message is twofold, see the message is twofold. One is, this is probably what too many people think they learned from the 60s. If you really fall in love with poor and working people and fight for them, you're going to die because the gangsters will kill you. And so people get scared. They get intimidated. But the other one is, is that you undergo such character assassination so that the neoliberal media and the myth that is dominant and hegemonic will try to misconstrue who you are and what you're doing in such a way that your love and your message can hardly come across. So when people talk about Brother Avakian, the first thing I want to talk about Avakian is his relation to the Soviet Union or China or something else. He said, wait a minute, I teach, I teach in prison for 37 years in prison. And I go into prison, they're talking about Bob Ovikian in a very different way. They ain't talking about his relation to communist China and his critique or Soviet Russia and his critique. But so much of the media wants to engage in this kind of character assassination. Now, that doesn't mean that all of us ought to be accountable. I'm, I've, I've debated Brother Vicky for what? Three, four hours, was it? In Riverside <laughs> Church. We go at it tooth and nail, because I'm not in the isms. I just want anything that's empowering the dignity and decency of working and poor people, and I'm thoroughly convinced that Re Revolutionary Communist Party is one particular avenue for the resistance, for the resilience, and for the critique of capitalism and imperialism and patriarchy and so forth and so on. There's a whole host of other organizations too, but when we're talking about solidarity, we're talking about those people who have backbone. And that's why I'd rather go to jail with a Carl Dix than have a dialogue with so many other folk who can talk, 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 and they never gonna do nothing. You see what I mean? You know, Carl and I get in there and sing Motown together and argue about a whole lot of things. 
but I know that he's got a love in him. He's got a commitment in him. He's got a willingness to serve. Same is true with Sankara. Would you go to jail? Would Noche go to jail? Same is true with Andy. When we fight hour and after hour, hour trying to make sense of all this stuff. Why? Because we've got, at least we, we, we're trying to empower each other to fight this spiritual decrepitude where people don't have backbone, they don't have spine. And, and, and given what it's, because part of the problem right now is, is that people are thinking, well, Biden and others are going to take care of it. Mm. Biden and others are going to take care of it. And it is already laid out. This brother's tied to crimes against humanity, invasions of Iraq, mass incarceration, Wall Street, greed. We can go on and on and on. But we voted for him because it was an anti-fascist vote. Now, we got in a lot of trouble for doing that now. From a lot of my leftist comrades. I know brother Chris Edgers and others went at me and I love that brother, he loves me. They say, brother Webster, you must be crazy. I said, no, no. even brother Ovechian's talking about that. Why Ovechian talking about, yes he is. I, we got to listen to folk been out here for 40, 50 years. They're not always right, but they can be right in some powerful ways, you see. But now that Biden's in, maybe we'll see in the next few days whether the coup takes place or not. People, we have to continually try to make available to people a vision and an analysis, but also an acknowledgement of we, if we don't get enough folk with backbone and willingness to fight and willingness to die, then all of, the, all of this is going to be a certain kind of sounding brass and tinkling symbol. How many Christians got on their wall Jesus running out the money changers in the temple? What was the temple? It was the largest edifice east of Rome. They had troops on the side. It was a bank. It was Wall Street. It was Pentagon. It was Congress. It was Harvard. It was Yale. It was Hollywood. It was corporate media running out those elites. Because what were they doing? They were oppressing the poor and telling lies to rationalize those kinds of crimes. Now, see, so you uh, ain't gonna get too many folks following Jesus there. You can't be on Pontius Pilate's payroll and be following Jesus. It's not going to work. Hey, but uh, if I just could cut in here a little bit. So, uh, you know, I agree with you. People need backbone. And there, first off, there are people with backbone. I mean, after George yes. Floyd was killed, there were all kinds of people came out in the street. The largest uh, uh, uprising for, for racial justice in, in, in history. It was, it was a beautiful. I'm not talking it, about just it, being part of one or two demonstrations, though, brother. I'm, I, I'm about, with you, but that's what I want yeah. to get into, why it was yeah, only okay. one or two demonstrations. And certainly there are people who are being heroic from people who are fighting around oh, the oh, yeah. uh, Absolutely. Uh, all different kinds of things. But where the problem is, I would just submit to you, Cornell, mm -hmm. is that... Uh, what has to ultimately ground that courage and a movement is an understanding of what it is we face. Because one of the things that that movement that arose was a lot of new people, they were young people, it wasn't led by the people initially who formed Black Lives Matter, but then they came up with demands that were not going to be realized under this system. Even black people are not going to support getting rid of the police under this system. And even in a new system, you're going to need some police. There's some people who have been fucked up by this system for some time. Excuse me, I know, and now I'm on the radio. But okay. But I'm just <laughs> saying that, the, that, that people need to understand what is, what is, what is oppressing them and, and that it can't be easily fixed. It's a system underneath it, and that resistance actually can lead to something if it is, in fact, infused with an understanding of the nature of the system that you face. And now here's what I'm going to argue with a little bit now on the sure. question of one of the biggest problems is, you know, certainly in the, in the wake of this COVID uh, crisis, or not in the wake of, in the midst of it, people are saying, oh, science actually matters. It could save lives. But people will not be scientific about understanding what happened in that first it matters what happened in the Soviet Union. It matters what happened in China. These were the slaves trying to be free. And they were defeated in that struggle, principally by what was thrown at them, but also secondarily by their own belief that, that it would be inevitable that communism would come out of this, that this is just a natural development the thing, that we're all different kinds of things we don't have time to get into in this show. And yeah. what Avakian has actually done is said, look, you have to be scientific about that too. There is a way out of the madness. That's why in his love, and it is love for the most oppressed people on the planet, it really is. It really is. Out of is. that comes a, it comes a determination to be rigorously scientific, to figure out, is there yes. a way out? 
If well, we were so I right, agree. why did we lose? See, that's another question which nobody else wanted to ask. If we were so right, why did we lose those struggles? And he said, well, we, here's, here's how we could go at it differently now. And too few people, especially too few intellectuals and even too few people in this era of the cloth or the rabbinicals or whatever, are, <laughs> are, are choosing to actually take a look and see that they're actually, he actually has charted a way out of this madness. And, 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 and we are striving to build a new a movement for an actual revolution. That's what inspired so many in the 60s. There was a massive struggle for civil rights. That's where even a, a kid like me got inspired. But then you get, then you start seeing the people who are willing to fight for revolution and you say, what is it that, not just what is it that they're saying, what is it that they're drinking, what is it they're eating, but what are they doing and why are they doing it? And could I, should I be a part of that? Are they right? Do they have an analysis that will lead where we need to go? And when people understand where they can go, it makes a big difference, even as spontaneously the slaves will rise up and just say, I'm not going to stay with this anymore. I'm getting out of here. But ultimately, to lead that, you have to know where you're going and how to get there. And that's what we that's what Bo Brother Bob Avakian brings to the brings to the struggle. And that's what we try to do in the RNL show. And I just want to say one more thing, if I can. OK, this is going to be a lot, a big, your last comments, big, Andy. OK, I'm sorry. I know, no, it's all right. Big, we just I wish we had more time. A big part of Bob Avakian's new communism is conversations like this. That's right. It is oh, the absolutely. concept of solid core of people who are committed to revolution, engaging and learning from people with very different views. This is why he, 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 he endeavors to build a movement that's going to have that kind of exchange that's not a closed system. We have our little thing and we insist on that, but that we're learning all the time, even as we're fighting for what we believe to be true. But we're also willing to change. Hmm if we think what we're saying is wrong, as he's one of the boldest people I've ever met in self-criticism. So I just think, I, you know, Cornell, I love you, and, I, and, and, and your love, love for Bob Vakian has meant a tremendous amount to me and to uh, thousands of other people. But I did want to bring out, you know, what it is that he's actually done and is doing, and it's just so painful to see what is happening to the people of the world because they don't understand what it is they face and where we need to go. And they do need that moral conviction that comes from people like yourself and, and Reverend Lamar. And I do want to thank you for not only what you said in the Washington Post, Reverend, but also what you said on New Year's Eve. I, I, I read that as well. And I thought they were very important comments that people need to uh, read and take to heart. People need to read his essay on bad theology kills people. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to read that. Where, okay. Where's yes. that appear, my yes. brother? Where's that appear? No, that was that was in faith and leadership, Doc. Uh, oh, I know. I read it somewhere. I said, yeah. Okay, I'll tell you guys it. what. We <laughs> we got about three minutes left on air. But if you want to stick around and talk a little longer, we could keep broadcasting on YouTube. It's up to you guys. I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we do I have to move mean. forward. The we, all right. Mean. All I'll right, then. The so I let would. me give let me give you, Reverend Lamar, a, a moment to to just make any closing remarks you want to share with our radio audience. You know, if, if you read the Gospels closely, it is clear that Jesus is executed because the religious power and the governmental political power want him dead. That's right. I am convinced that the religious power in America and the government still want him dead. Right. Anyone who rises to say that the way that you have ordered society fundamentally flies in the face of what I think that Dr. West and I and those from our tradition would call the vision that the divine had in planting the world and speaking the world into existence. And that's another thing that the, the tie in the Hebrew scriptures, it says that God planted a garden, taking the divine, and marrying the divine with the working people, with labor, with sweat, with exertion of energy, and understanding that the divine among us, that the powerful in religious systems and political systems seek to extinguish that light. And what we have to do is to continue to move in that direction and to understand that we must risk something in order for the new world to come. It does not come without price. And what, what always catches me finally about the story that animates us and that animated the black prophetic tradition is that the machinations of death kill, but what God does finally 
in the myth that orders our lives is God overturns death with resurrection. And so what I keep doing, I think this is kind of what you're leading toward Andy is their life is possible, but it is only possible in community. It is only possible when we understand that the narrative outside of us that assaults us, we must assault it with love and with a different vision. And so I really believe there are people out there who are waiting for this and we've got to keep speaking, keep loving, keep disagreeing, but there is some, some spiritual reality that is drawing us together in this moment. And, and it's exciting. Well, thank you, Reverend Lamar. Cornell, do you have any final reflections for the on-air audience? No, this has just been so rich. It's been so rich. And I was, I was thinking of Frederick Douglass' second address he gave in 1893 in Chicago when he talked about Haiti. And he said, you know, there's not one nation that talked about Christianity that had an indictment of slavery. Not one major church and one major denomination had an indictment of slavery. But here I am, here Ida B. Wells is, here Ferdinand Bernard is, here, 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 here Brother Irving is, Irving Penn. They're the ones that wrote the pamphlet. We are in the belly of the beast trying to bear witness to a truth that is unstoppable, a flame that cannot be put out. And it has deeply secular brothers and sisters at the center of it. You can't understand a world without Marx. It's going to be deeply it's going to be some Buddhist sisters. There's going, to be, there's going to be some Jewish folk. There's going to be some Christians. There's going to be a whole host of folk. But it's not the ism. It's the vision, the authenticity of the witness, and the subtle understanding of what one is up against in terms of the operations of power all coming together to make the world a better place. Let's see, that's the kind of spirit I'm talking about. There's a whole lot of fleshiness in that spirit. It's a whole lot of materiality in that spirit, but it's still the word made flesh. And it's not just the flesh, it's not just the words, it's how it's put together, the life lived, the quality of the organization. In that sense, we are talking about Obik. We won't go back to his Armenian origins. Oh, oh, there's a whole lot of deep, deep, deep Christian soil there among that world historical people. But we're talking about what he did with it, what Revolutionary Communist Party has been able to do with it. Whatever one's disagreements, you cannot but acknowledge the deep love, conviction, commitment to the least of these that puts a smile on a revolutionary Christian like me from the chocolate side of town, but embracing every part of town. Well, let me tell you, it has been such a joy to be with all three of you. If you are listening on the radio and you want to tune in to our overtime discussion, it'll be on youtube.com slash the revcoms. We're going to keep talking for a few more minutes. You've been listening to Dr. Cornell West, that's who you just heard. Andy Z, who is the host of the Revolution Nothing Less show and together with Cornell and myself, and a co-initiator of refusefascism.org. And Reverend William Lamar, who is the pastor at the Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, DC, that was attacked by Proud Boys. We've been having a conversation about what is the danger that we face in Trump's unprecedented effort and campaign to overturn the election, which is coming to a head in a big way tomorrow. Um, I would urge people to go to the website, refusefascism.org for more information. And, and I know there are a poster campaign, other ways that people could access if you wanna take a stand against that. And, oh, Brother Cornell, you mentioned the dialogue you had with Bob Avakian on revolution and religion, an extraordinary talk and discussion and debate everybody should watch it. It was beautiful. It had love for humanity. And one of the things that was so precious about it is there was an honest exchange of, of differences with an utter lack of ego because it wasn't about oneself. It was about humanity. You mentioned the narcissism of the times. And I just want to give that to all of the audience as a place to go. It's available at revcom.us. It, it really is an extraordinary dialogue. And with that, I want to say, if you missed any portion of tonight's program, you can find the full broadcast archived at WBAI.org or WPFWFM.org. I want to thank the revolutionary future rock band, Outer National, for the music I use to open every show. I want to thank Sierra Shine and Reggie Johnson for engineering. And remember, the problem is not human nature. It is the nature of the system. Through an actual revolution, a better world is possible. I'll be back next week, uh, and I'll see you then. Oh, 
Okay, now it's just us. Hello. So the radio is over. Listen, I want to thank you guys. That was so beautiful. That was a rich dialogue. You get yourself, Brother Andy and Brother Lamar together. Whoo, the sheer eloquence and the analysis cutting through all of the fog. So here's something that I wanted to I wanted to ask that I didn't have time for. And I, I just hinted at it in my closing comment about the dialogue that you had with Cornell with Bob Avakian. There was a couple of things that, that I wanted to pull out of your last comments, Cornell, where you talked, you began with the narcissism, the individualism. Mm -hmm. And I would link that to, and Avakian has, has really linked that to the, the parasitism mm -hmm. of the age that we're in, of, of capitalism, imperialism globalized turbo global globalized right. where oh, he's right you're about just are swimming in stuff that's made by oh. children in sweatshops and mines and and you have no idea where it comes from and there's there's this a parasitism that's unparalleled in human history and it's linked to it's not the only factor in the individualism but it's there's so much of that as an obstacle absolutely and then there was something that andy was talking about which i actually think are very linked and so just bear with me and then i'll, I'll give you all a chance to to go where you want to with this but the relativism the sense that and it's linked to the individualism that i have my truth you have your truth everybody has their own truth and so there's a lack of certitude there's both the individualism looking out for yourself a lot of the people who don't like the trump world who don't like the white supremacy, they are still caught up in a lot of self in the in the individualistic comfort way, but also self in the sense of I have a truth, you have a truth, no one has very much certitude because everything is relative. And so they're, they're different dimensions, but they're both paralyzing. And so I, and on the other side, you have tremendous fascist certitude. You know, we're right, you're wrong. We'll burn your Black Lives Matter banner. There, that was not, well, maybe that's your truth. This is my truth. That was our truth. Might makes right is going to crush everything else. That's right. And so you have a you have this very bad polarization. It's not that there aren't millions and millions who don't like what's happening, but the millions who millions who don't like what's happening are very paralyzed right now. And I'm, I'm trying to look at these two dimensions of the, of the narcissism, the individualism, but also the, the, the way that that gets manifest in, in epistemology, my truth, your truth, all of that. So it's a, big, it's a big question, but we are not on the clock anymore. So anybody who wants to go first. Oh, those are deep questions now, deep questions. I think part of the problem is, is that uh, when certain truths that can be validated go in the face of the entrenched interests of greedy elites who never want to be accountable, that they can come up with all kinds of alternative realities. And it's not like Fox is the only one creating alternative reality. You see, the neoliberal press, they create their alternative reality too. They lying too. They ain't saying a mumbling word about drones. They're not saying about how many bombs were dropped on Obama. They're not saying a word about Wall Street. They're not saying a word about poverty. They've got their own alternative reality too. But see, the corporate media is designed in such a way that people think there's just two alternatives. And because the neo-fascist one, which is just one wing of the ruling class, is so far out that the neoliberal wing of the ruling class presents itself as normal for those who are supposedly progressive. You see, that's, that's you got to be on a crack pipe for a long time to really believe that. But the crack pipe has been normalized. You know what I mean? It's like people think, oh, that, 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 no, these truths that we're talking about are not relative. They're not, we're not nihilist about it. They actually can be verified, validated, but it flies in the face of the interests of the ruling class, of the power elites. And that's where the the real rubber hits the road there, you see, because they want to get rid of any voices that are going to be bringing those kind of, of truths to bear. And this is true in the churches. You know, you think of your struggle in the AME church, given the black bourgeoisie and given the role of what I want to get too much. I, I didn't want to get on radio, start talking about the bishops and things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go. go <laughs> I'm pulling the praying for you, brother. But, but you know the truth about the decadence of the black bourgeoisie in the, the, the history of the black church. 
and the roles that they play of guiding people away from the struggle, away from engagement toward comfort and convenience and so forth and so on. You see, not the whole black bourgeoisie, because no such thing as the monolithic one, but the dominant tendency of every bourgeoisie is that, no matter what color they are. And you have to cut against that in that way. You know, that one of the things that uh, I've been trying to learn more about, and Catherine Tanner has a wonderful book, Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism. Yeah, you see, I wrote the blurb on that. Oh, oh Doc, listen, you, this book, oh, that's, I'm, that's I'm, I'm taking it very book. slowly. It is, it is an important, important text. text. It's a very important text. Absolutely. And so learning about the financialization of capitalism yes. and how, because the way that not only corporations grow larger, but the way that government is tied to international finance means that government in its policy making will do things that are against the needs of the citizenry to keep the bond rating up. So it's a, it's a very slippery slope. And, the, and she talks about when, when um, you were trying to uh, ask, the, when you were asking the question, Andy, why aren't people in the streets? One of the things she talks about is that the way that financial capital, capitalism works is people are so consumed with trying to exist, trying to carve out some sense of meaning for themselves, trying to take care of their responsibilities. And I had never thought about it. She, she states it so eloquently that the past, the present and the future are conflated into one moment. And so even the vision necessary to see what is possible, that energy is ground up in the machinery of the financial capital, capitalism, which keeps them from any form of human flourishing. So her project is to say, let's use this alternative narrative of Christianity to fight this and to envision something different. So I'm, I'm still on that thing. And I, 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 and I agree with you, Heidi, that the, the story itself is not enough, but I agree also that you said it has to be something that attracts people know at a very deep level that, that they are being exploited. But when you talk about a lot of these folks, and I learned this from Grant Wacker, a great historian of Christianity, that when the world is shaking, when you got all kinds of change coming at you from every direction, people then find a dogma to hold on to. Mm. So, with the dawn of the information age, and we don't know what's gonna happen with AI. We don't know what's gonna happen with our wages. We don't know if we're gonna be able to pay our tuition. You hold to the dogma of the American myth. You hold to the dogma of white evangelicalism. I, I think that one of the moral imperatives for those of us who have a revolutionary view is we have to become the best damn storytellers in the world, living and telling it in such a way that people are that we appeal to them and they sign up. What is it that Jesus said to those early disciples that made them leave their boats and say, we're going with this dude, right? We got to think about Avaki and others. They cast a story that is important. And, and we really have to, we have to keep, mm -hmm. keep thinking about that. Andy? Brother Andy. Well, <laughs> You know, I think, I think people do need to understand where the, what the problem they face is and then what the solution is and the relationship between those things. And what does science mean? It means proceeding from reality, proceeding from how the world actually functions. Uh, look, capitalism has gone through some big changes in the last uh, 30 years. Globalization, financialization, uh, uh, in-time production. Uh, you know, uh, you, you know, it's it, the and some of the American mythology, you know, is is frayed on account of that. Just pull, you know, hard work will get you somewhere. It, it won't get you anywhere if there's no jobs there. You know, uh, Bacon has talked about you listen to his speech. He said, you know, Obama, he criticized Obama's speech on Father's Day in Philadelphia. Just pull your pants up, pull your pants up. You'll get a job. No, those jobs aren't there. Those jobs are now <laughs> all, all over the world. But that's not something 
Okay. Black exactly. respectability, black respectability. Okay. That's right, that's right. Yeah. But there's also an analysis here. See, this whole idea of neoliberalism being some different form of capitalism is not true. No, it's a, it's it's, a it's, project it's, within it's, capitalism. It's, it's, it's it's a uh, it, there's been development in it, but the essential nature of capitalism itself is is as 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 a system that is based on everything being produced is being produced by masses of people to produce at this point commodities all over the world. There's no production. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe I have a garden in my backyard, or some people in a neighborhood have a garden and and they're they're eating their some fresh vegetables, fine. But in terms of society as a whole, everything is produced for profit. And what does that actually mean? A lot of people can say that, oh yeah, there's profit. That's really bad. Well it is, but what's bad about it? It means that that capitalism is produced socially. Everything is produced socially. But the 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 work that people do what they create is appropriated privately. That's one part of capitalism. That's the only thing you'll hear from traditional Marxists is, oh, the problem is the working class against the capitalist class. But what Avakian, what Bob Avakian has brought forth from uh, actually an insight of Marx that's been long buried is that the actual form, the actual form of which this big contradiction takes place is one in which capitalism and capital this transformation of, 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 of the need to do things into, uh, into social relation where people have to produce to benefit a capitalist, it only exists as many capitals, which is to say that they compete with each other. It's, it's a doggy dog system. Cornell, you and I are old enough uh, to remember Eastern Airlines, okay? Oh, Where's yeah. Eastern Airlines? Where's Pan Am Airlines? That doesn't exist anymore. Come and that go. Capital still Come exists. And go. Bob Avakin gives the example. You know, Kaiser's a medical for, uh, uh, company here out in California, but it used to make cars. Okay, this is capital. It's a dog eat dog system, and competition is built into it. It's not something new with neoliberalism. And as long as you have that, that ideology permeates every aspect of society. Capital gets put together in countries and they compete with each other. That's, it's, that competition gives rise to wars. It gives rise to, there's a big disagreement between the Democrats and the Republicans over how to wage uh, trade wars. Is it, is it gonna be multilateralism, multi, or is it gonna be uh, you know, more transactional the way uh, Trump was advocating for? And there's many people, this is why the stock market in part goes up under him, because there's many people who believe that's actually a better solution to the competitiveness of the United States. But the ideas, are in everybody's head. See, this is what a, Bob Avakian has a piece called uh, Hope for Humanity on a Scientific Basis, where he talks about this individualism and how people perceive things. He says the selfie is an avatar for our age. What about my brand? You hear, thir you hear third graders talking about their brand. They're commodifying themselves. They're getting prepared for a life under this system. Even the most intimate relations are destroyed by, this, by the nature of the system and reflect that, and so does the political system itself. So there's a necessity here why I'm going into this now. It's part of what goes into people being so self-absorbed and self-contained. There's an economic system under it that needs to be overthrown. It can't be reformed. Somebody needs to make a case that if you went back to a more competitive form of capitalism rooted only in the country, but not international, which I think is an impossibility at this stage. Right. Absolutely. Okay, but in, on the other hand, it, make a case that that won't be exploitative. Tell me how great it was in the 1950s. Make the case for that, because the problem is the system itself. And it, yes, it's gone through changes that's presented new challenges for us, but it's also created a basis for a communist world, for a world where people are cooperative. No, it's a long struggle between here and there. I'm not trying to be utopic about <laughs> it. But, uh, but I'm saying that, that unless we face what we really, unless we deal with, with what we're really facing, and this is what a, a BA teaches is this, and what he brings forward, unless we face what we're, at, confront what we're actually facing, we're not gonna get beyond it. That's why he's written the constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. An uh, economy that would not be based on this. On but, is on that, but I think what, what, what Brother Vacant also recognizes is, is that in earlier periods, let's say in the 30s when the crisis hit, you did have masses in the street. And one of the reasons why you had masses in the street was you had 
oppositional parties. You had communist parties. You had socialist parties. You had the CIO. You had A. Philip Randolph. You had oppositional churches. They had their own press. They had their own newspapers. They had their own subcultures. They hadn't been sucked into the monopoly of a corporate media or the polarization of a social media such that they didn't have communities of opposition. In the 1960s, you had alternative parties. You had church leaders so that when Martin Luther King came to town, the people who hated him had to take notice because the people showed up. What was the percent of the churches that supported Martin and Montgomery? It wasn't a majority, but they showed up because they people were there because they were scared. These petty bourgeois Negro preachers were afraid. But Martin was another petty bourgeois preacher that said, I love the people and I'm going with the people. And he became influential for a while. You see, by the time he dies, 55% of black folk against him, 74% of white folk against him, because he didn't make the connection between the police and Pentagon. He made the connection between bombs dropped in Vietnam, falling in Harlem, falling in the south side of Chicago, falling in, in, on the barrio, on the reservation. So he's got a broader analysis. So he no longer has a, a source of appeal in that way, you see. But in the 60s, you still had infrastructures. You had parties. You had slices of churches that provided different press, vision, analysis, ways of understanding the world. What we have today, very weak on parties. How many left-wing parties you got in American empire right now of any real substance and courage? Not too many. We represent the Communist Party and a few others, but not a whole lot left. And they're much smaller than they were before. And if they were to surface with power, they would be dragged to jail. That's part of what Julian Assange is about. That's what part of what 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 what, 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 what was, who was the uh, the sisters who saying we went to who, who, who now uh, uh, Channing is that it used to be Chelsea and she changed Manning. Chelsea Manning. Manning. Yes, yes, Sister Chelsea Manning. I mean, these are courageous folk. They got backbone. They, they expose the lies and the crimes of the empire. They get mistreated, lied on, crushed, you see, and they don't have parties behind them. <laughs> Part of our challenge, be, this is where the issue about a, a backbone comes in again, you see, not because this heroic wheel, because an analysis shows that the ruling classes have tried to completely undermine the very sources of our institutional presences across the board so that all of our movements are so individuated and so thoroughly uh, 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 differentiated that we can't come together. That's why when, you, when they pull out a call in 1930, the fascists are coming to town. Hey, all you gotta do is go to the Communist Party and the CIO and, and make sure you're gonna have thousands of people show up overnight because they got, a, they got mechanisms of communication, information, the, the culture, they go. People show up, you know, it's like you know, it's like Prince is coming to town. Oh, everybody <laughs> starts showing up because he's got a presence. Well, can you imagine what the left wing analogy with that would be? That's what we're talking about. People who got a vision and courage and they show up. So, so the Revolutionary Communist Party and, and Antifa and a few others don't have to be one of the few out there every day breaking their neck, getting, get, getting pushed back and they keep fighting back over and over again rather than having millions behind them. When, when Sansara calls those things every day, she should have hundreds of thousands of people in the empire behind her. Go, Sister Sansara. Go, Sister. You, We all here with you. Now, she going to show up, whether it's 5 or 15, because that's the kind of sister she is. But I'm talking about thousands and millions of folk. And that's what we're looking for, and that's where we're headed toward, I hope. You know, with the just, love at the center, though, with the love at the center. Let me just, for everybody who has been affected by, which is almost everybody, the uh, media brainwash and five minute attention span, and some people who are probably watching who are too young to even know, Chelsea Manning, I just want to say, um, is a very courageous woman who exposed, uh, who leaked documents proving 
and a di footage of a war crime in Iraq, targeted assassination intentionally, one after the other, where the US soldiers carrying this out in Iraq were chuckling and laughing. And when people came to assist and aid those who had been targeted from the sky, they shot at the family members coming to get the people who were injured and, and were laughing about it and joking about it. And when this got leaked out, Chelsea was criminalized and put in prison and tortured and went through an incredible amount. And the people who carried out that war crime were not. And I just think this gets to the question of American empire, American imperialism, a very important core of American lives are not more important than other people's lives. But part of the problem that we're up against is with this individualism, the parasitism is, this is a big difference from the 60s too. People in this country do not think about the rest of the world. They, you know, that was an actual, as I understand it, that was a new thing in the 60s. It was a big advance that was fought for and won. And right now it is, it is very striking how little people think about or even acknowledge the, 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 the rest of the world at all. And, and there is no anti-war movement to be spoken of. There is no awareness. There's a, the, the man is threatened, had to be talked out of, Trump had to be talked out of bombing Iran at, from reports just two weeks ago. And nobody, like almost nobody knows it. Nobody's concerned. He's moving warships around over there. So it, this is it, one, it's information for people watching just so we don't slide over yeah. who Chelsea Manning is, but it's also related to what's holding people back right now. I wonder if um, there's two other things I want to ask about. Um, and we'll see how long we, we want to stay together doing this. But I thought uh, Cornell earlier mentioned that, and I know that uh, you mentioned that you and Avakian, I know I did, I voted for the first time in my life. Well, actually, that's not true. I voted when I turned 18. I voted again um, for the first time since I became a revolutionary and a communist. I voted for Biden. And at the time, it was not because Biden was a solution not because he represented something good or in the interest of the people, he also represents the same system, but because he was not part of the fascist consolidation and takeover, that he was not Trump and not part of that, which I think was very important. But when, when that was done, and Avakian put out a very important statement on August 1st that advanced the need to do this as a part of advancing the need for there to be massive opposition in the streets to drive out the Trump-Pence regime through nonviolent mass protest. Uh, he made the point, and then he elaborated on this even more deeply uh, a, a few weeks later in another statement that said, voting will not be enough. We need to take to the streets and stay in the streets. And I think I, it might be helpful to talk about, some people heard, and I know you were mentioning Cornell having some discussion with others about, even Avakian is saying vote for Biden, which is true, but a lot of people heard just that part, vote for Biden, period. And they're acting on that. I mean, not all because of a vacant, because of other things that they have in their mind. They voted in overwhelming okay. numbers against Trump for good reason. And when people poured into the streets, I went, I danced, I was crying with my neighbors. It was beautiful. Um, but then they, that was all they wanted to do. And I think we have to also go at why voting is not enough. And, and without making the Democrats and the Republicans the same, they are not right now. One is carrying out a coup as we speak, trying to, whether it's successful or not, there is not a comparison between them. They're not the same, but they are part of the same system. I guess that would be a comparison between them. They are serving the same system and, and they don't represent an answer. And there is still incumbent on the people a need to act outside of their tent and the terms they're setting independently, both fundamentally, ultimately through a revolution, I would argue, and obviously Andy and so we're of that school of thought. Um, but even short of that right now, uniting all kinds of people, including the vast majority who voted for Biden, acting in the streets to counter what is being done with this rising fascism. So I guess, you know, this, this Voting is not enough, and this passivity. I think maybe one more pass on this. Maybe that's the last question I'll ask. Well, I hear you. You all jump right in, jump right in. Uh, dear sisters, she's on a roll raising these high quality queries. <laughs> Brother Lamar, Brother Andy, y'all want to jump on me? Well, I would give. Uh... I know we're not just taking turns, but if uh, Reverend Lamar, you want to speak first, that's fine with me. Or and I, I meant to say a long time ago, please call me Bill. 
please. Oh, okay. Oh, oh I, yeah, I just, yeah, please. Read. So I think there's uh, more melody in Lamar. <laughs> yeah, do, do, do <laughs> Lamar, do Lamar. <laughs> what about? Both but Lamar followed by that IV. That last, Lamar the fourth is yeah, like that last that's, name. Lamar, that, 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 that's a rich name, man. Yeah. I, I like that. I like that. It's a great. We have a great tradition. That's um, the truth. That's the yeah, truth. Voting, voting is definitely not enough. It's it's the first step into the house of what's possible, right? You, mm. you, it's the first step. It is it is it is going across the threshold, and I think. One of the big things that I have to fight is apathy toward the system. And we know that thinking people's apathy makes a lot of sense, right? So you, you have to have a, tr a real conversation with people, those who are apathetic, but then the, to remind them that in voting, you have not completed political participation, right? That, that organizing and advocacy. So let me, let me speak from the perspective with which I'm most familiar. So trying to organize black pastors and churches in Washington, DC, in Maryland, in Florida, where I was prior, was like trying to pull teeth. And there were many theological, philosophical, political overlays that kept them from understanding that you've got to organize and agitate in order to get something that those in power, by virtue of your being right or moral, they're not moved by that. So I'm very, I'm very clear that you've got to build power and you've got to agitate, you've got to fight, you've got to take it to people. And the biggest impediment from my perspective, it may just be that that because I'm in a theological space, that's how I see things, but their view of salvation, which really ties into the narrative that you all have set around individualism, they see the work of God as individualistic. They do not see community. It is difficult when people cannot see communal reality as the fundamental theological reality to get them to do anything. And so I think that for all of the many groups of people that you all have mentioned, Christians, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, whomever, we've got to figure out how we charge people to understand that the disruptors that they admire, the interrupters that they admire, they never stopped at voting. Right? That, was, that was the beginning. Whether they were voting to join a labor union or voting for a mayor, or voting for whatever, they knew that that was just the beginning. But, but we also need to understand the large, the, the big history, the grand history of people trying to suppress vote. They understand that if people ever can figure out that's the first step into the house, they then do everything they can to guard people from getting in the yard, right? And so there's, there's so much here at play. But what I try to do is teach and teach and model that you don't just vote for the mayor, but there are groups of us who then go to the mayor's desk and say, Madam Mayor, in our case, you cannot outsource the bus driving jobs to this French corporation that doesn't pay people, right? That becomes our responsibility. Madam Mayor, we can't have people in public housing who are citizens who do pay taxes living in rodent infested, mold infested spaces when the District of Columbia had the largest surpluses of any large city in the world. Mm. Mm. That, that, that is the continued political work. And still that doesn't get us to, to revolution. But I think the reason that Avakian and others are saying you gotta vote for Biden in spite of holding your nose is because we've got to build this plane as we fly it. And too many people die when we disengage from the policy victories, which are not enough, but hopefully can move us while making sure, like Dr. King said, that we don't become addicted to the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. We're trying to hold a lot of things in tension. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you are having this struggle with others in the church, over an individualistic, forgive me if I, if I'm gonna do my best to characterize what I understood from you, but when you're having that struggle over a more individualistic 
interpreta interpretation of the church and religion versus a more communal one? What kind of traction are you getting? What are you running into? Who's, who's drawn to it and why? And who is repelled by it and so why? I, I did, uh, two things. You go yeah. to, the, to the wonderful work of James Weldon Johnson, who, who re-narrates the creation poetically. And his language, and my grandmother made us memorize this. God said, I'm lonely. I'll make me, Johnson writes, a man. I'll make human beings. So what I teach is, what you got to do is you got to use the scripture because they believe in it, is that God, God's self desires community. That's what I teach. I teach that one of the first actions of Jesus in any of the gospels is to call to himself a community to build a group. And so what I tell them is that is fundamentally against who we claim to be, that this has never been about an individual relationship. So Grover Norquist, who says that I want to drown the American government in the bathtub, well, theologically, what white evangelicals have done is they have drowned the cosmic beauty of the gospel in the bathtub of personal salvation. And understand the reason they want to say the only precinct for the gospel is personal salvation is because they do not want the gospel in economics. They do not want it in politics. They do not want it in scholarship, truthfully. They want it to stay in human hearts, but it's too big for that, right? So we're fighting against people who they really know, I'm sorry, in my opinion, they know what this stuff is. And they know that they have to shape shift it and bend it and just turn it into something different that buttresses their system. I, I truly believe that your politics must have a theology, right? You, the, the Proud Boys who are arguing with us on Facebook, the trolls, they are using theological language. They are saying that God is with them, that God will defeat me, that God will defeat us. I mean, so we have, we have to be very clear on, on all fronts. We're fighting this on theological fronts. And then for those who are humanists, atheists, agnostics, you're fighting it on different fronts. But I love the fact that we can all come together because we've got this revolutionary vision from whatever our systems are, whatever our stories are. And it is, it is possible that we can continue to pierce this myth, even if enough of us do it over a long enough period of time we will see traction. It's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be hard won, and those who don't want it will fight you incessantly. They will, the minute you win something, it just means you go to another no, place no. of struggle, right? And, and, and Brother Andy's point that, that we've got a lot of fellow citizens and fellow human beings who have backbone, who are out there fighting. And some of them are secular communists, some of them are Christian, some of them are Jewish and so forth. But the question becomes, how do you come together? See, when Emma Goldman used to say, uh, if you could fundamentally change the system in a revolutionary way by means of voting, the ruling class would make voting illegal. And she's right about that. Because voting, mm -hmm. now, it's not only that it only take you a certain way, but it's, it is one particular form of weaponry. That's why you fight. We have to use every form of weaponry we had. That's, six, that's the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Put on the whole armor. When you put on the whole armor, it means that sometimes you got to vote for Biden. When you're voting for Biden, you got to vote for Biden and have tons of cognac after. You, know what I mean? <laughs> hey, you, you might need some whiskey, you know what I mean? In the name of Jesus for me, but I mean, I'm not putting that on everybody else. Because I mean, this, this cat's got, his, got, got blood on his hands, but it's an anti fascist vote because they had more blood. And see, Brother Ovation understands human history is the history of poor and working people's blood being crushed by elites, whatever form it takes, but they keep fighting back anyway. They resist. They got resilience. That's part of our tradition, you see. But we get defeated, we bounce back. They talk about us, we tell the truth. We bear witness. And voting is one little weapon in the middle of America going fascist because fascism would call into question the very possibility of any kind of voices like ours. But as soon as we do it, we don't go off the cliff. We're right on the edge of the cliff. The rot is still there. It's just slowly, it's slowed a bit and it's recycled, but the rot is still there in a deep way. And, and I, 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 I agree with Lovakian's arguments, both in August 
that, uh, you know, very much so, very much so. Uh, well, we, we have um, just a couple of, just a few, ar a, f a few arguments on the table here. One, role of elections in this society. Two, the role of, uh, of theology in social change and the role of science in the role of ch change. And what, what's the, is there, what, what are those two things about? And then Sansara put on the table, not only revolution, but what do we do about, it's, this is a very immediate question, what do we do? about this fascist imperative, this fascist movement, this fascist president and this coup d'etat that's going on, which yes, likely won't succeed in the immediate, but many defeated coups have come back to seize power or to oh, take yeah. power later on. So that's true. you've got three big questions going on here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna try to speak to them. And uh, this is for me is a big challenge because I didn't bring a pen. And uh, so I'm like, if I can remember everything that's just been said, one thing, I want to just start with, in terms of the this particular, I'm going to start with the elections, go to the theology, religion, and go to the immediate situation. In terms of this election, Bob Avakian also wrote that if um, if if a doorknob was running for president and uh, and the doorknob could defeat Donald Trump, he would recommend voting for a doorknob. Okay, and, and the point being is that in this particular election. There was a need to, and as we can see how right this was, a need for a very big margin of victory. Because imagine if this, mm. if this had been uh, how, how the last election was, or how most elections are actually. This is the, the, the margin by which Biden won, uh, both electorally and in terms of the popular vote, was large enough that they actually are not able, to, even should they succeed in any one of these states, they don't have enough to actually win. They're really going to have to go all, all the way. This is why we recommended voting this time for Biden. But as a general thing, we have this uh, thing we call the BEB. Uh, now, we're not on the radio anymore, so I can say bourgeois electoral bullshit. Look, elections under, under this system have, a, have this problem, is that what you're at, the candidates are actually pre-selected and selected in an audition process, not unlike The Apprentice or you know uh, all those song, song and dance shows that they have, some of which can be entertaining, more entertaining than the elections, but uh, they all have the sense of being an audition. Both are your policies consistent with what those on top want, and even and just as important is are your poli are you able to reach a section of the masses of people who we need to act, give their acquiescence to what we plan to do. Do and I'm speaking now in the voice of the ruling classes or a section of the ruling classes. In other words, what they audition, you know, this is why even you, you, you know, uh, 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 when you have uh, Bernie Sanders running the first time and even the second time, and or Al Sharpton or these other or different people running, uh, they they say, well, we put them in the early debates with, with their appointed role is to draw people in, but then ultimately they're going to go for the mainstream Democratic candidate. You see, that's, their role is to bring people into a process and to winnow out uh, all, uh, the, what are the reasons, see, everybody's got to say, what, what, what can, I'm, I'm a practical man, they tell people in America, you have to go for what's possible. But the politics of the possible are a monstrosity. We have to go for the impossible. And every revolution seems impossible before it takes place. And then everybody says, well, of course, we saw all the conditions and stuff. You know, oh, everybody knew it was coming. No, you didn't know it was coming and you opposed it, by the way. Um, and you worked That's very hard to oppose it, including, right. including the reformers, including the reformers, right. not just the big, not just the big That's powers, right. but the reformers. And here, here's one of the things. So I just wanted to say that elections under this system at this time in history are a means of control and gaining the acquiescence uh, of the population. Now, does that mean we should, shouldn't fight against uh, gerrymandering? We shouldn't fight against the exclusion uh, and disenfranchisement of, 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 of prisoners? That, does that mean the freedom rides were for naught? Absolutely not, because the struggle for equality is part of the struggle for a, for a new world. 
But then we have to have the good sense and the, and the scientific understanding to understand that sometimes you fight for a right that you don't need to exercise. So that's just a general point on elections. And at this point, it was, it was very important to vote this time. But the, the fundamentally, what, what is going to drive out this fascist or put this fascist imperative, this fascist movement on the defensive is the struggle of the masses of people in the streets. And it needs to be a nonviolent mass sustained struggle to do that. That is the only way that we can really put them on the defensive at this point. At this point, there are other forms, you know, situations change, the world doesn't stand still. Um, so that's, that's just a, 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 a first point, and it's very pregnant right now in terms of what's going on, because people are not acting the way they should act, and we've identified some of the causes, the individualism that's uh, reinforced by this, how much stuff can I get, and what about my brand, and what about me, and everything, and, and I'm very interested in how you say the theology has actually reinforced you know, that, and uh, that's mm -hmm. not a surprise. It's, it goes through every section of, 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 of society, and, uh, you know, it's a, you know, back when I was coming up, there were, uh, uh, there were people in the, uh, um, there was the black liberation theology. There was liberation theology overall in the Christian faiths. There was, uh, there were, uh, uh, like in many young white youth, I was influenced by the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then Malcolm X, a Muslim, and 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 coming out of my parents were in the Jewish tradition. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, there was a struggle for justice there too. But at a certain point, I did have to come to confront that to actually change the world, you need to understand the world as it actually as it actually is, and that. Uh, while I have, tr and Baba Vakin does have respect for and has worked with closely with and shared the stage with uh, Cornell West, um, ultimately, I believe people need to cast off religious belief to be able to act on the world. And that does not mean an end of morality. Right now, people often go to the church in, or the temple or, or the mosque for a sense of morality to do what's right. But Avakian has said that there is a place where epistemology and morality meet. And epistemology means the, uh, how we know what's true or how we, how we understand the world. There's a place where epistemology and morality meet. There's a place where you have to stand and say it is not acceptable to refuse to look at something or to believe something because it makes you feel uncomfortable. And it is not accepted to believe something just because it makes you feel comfortable. This is a very pregnant uh, situation, uh, 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 a statement rather, that, that people really need to think a lot about because, um, you know, I, I was trained or I became an artist and uh, science has been a relatively, been the, Becoming scientific has been a product of becoming a revolutionary and the work of, of Bob Avakian, as well as a book uh, by Ardea Skybreak, who is a trained uh, evolutionary biologist and who has contributed a lot to the scientific uh, understanding of the new communism. But So I came to this, but it, it is true that you have to understand things, see the patterns in things. And she quotes in her book uh, something from Neil deGrasse Tyson. It said, when do you understand science, it means you don't have to be afraid of the truth. You don't have to be afraid of reality. You can deal with reality. This is so important. So look, I think... Um, I want to say one word, uh, just two more things. One, why the movements today are where they're at and not what they were in the 1960s or the 1930s. And we could have a whole discussion about the 1930s and, you know, and what was actually uh, involved there and, and, and how they tied, the not, movement in this country tied themselves to U.S. imperialism, even the, where the communists got to the point of saying uh, communism is 20th century Americanism. It was, and became very patriotic. Um, uh, named their bookstores the Jefferson Bookstores. Let's just let's, do, let's be honest about that period of, of history, a slave owner. And it was known to them that he was a slave owner. This wasn't something that they discovered after reading Howard Zinn. They knew this. Okay, but this was a this was a belief in America at that time. The 1960s were really different. A lot of this was discarded, and, and there, a whole new movement arose, you know, out of the black liberation movement and out of who were looking to places like China. So I just want to go back to this question of the defeat of the of of the 
of the revolution in China in particular, the cultural revolution in China, and the short, uh, had a tremendous impact in the world. One of the things that actually, ironically, inspired me was the liberation struggles in Africa. Uh, and, 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 you know, I've had people at Revolution Books who, where we've, you know, in fact, we had a whole program with uh, Herb Boyd on Malcolm X's well, diaries on his tour of Africa. Yes. And there were a lot of old Pan-Africans in the house. And I said, you got to confront what happened here. You see, they, you got to confront what happened here. These people became, these people ended up becoming, not for lack of heroism, not for lack of bra bravery. These people laid down their lives and made tremendous sacrifices. And now in Angola, Vakian points this out in his book, The New Communism, the richest woman, the first billionaire in Africa is the daughter of the leader of the Angolan revolution. So this is, if you're not scientific about this stuff, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, I consider uh, Gugi Watiango a friend, but if you look at Kenya now, it's, 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 it's outrageous what's happened there. But this is because people don't understand the system they're fighting and what it takes to get free. This is something we are trying to bring to people now. But now we do come to the situation we face with this fascism. We can't have go out among the people on Wednesday and Thursday and say, we want to tell you the history of communism, the need to be scientific. You know, we can't go through everything <laughs> in, in three days. We do have to tell them, though, you know, what they are facing. Really, what they are facing right now That's is, right. Is, is the consolidation, a further consolidation, possibly to seize power right now, undemocratically through these election through overthrowing the election or even what's more likely is a consolidation of a hard fascist core of a of a alternative presidency in exile contention within the fascist camp from the tom cottons and these other people who are not joining in with the you know even pat robertson talk about uh when pat robertson says that you're you're detached from reality you know you got a problem okay <laughs> which so you know uh, this is <laughs> This is this is a situation we face. We got to get out among the masses of people right now and and tell them, you know, which look and I understand it's very dangerous in the streets of Washington right now, which is why we're advocating people putting signs in their windows. We're at, we have a sign to refuse fascism that says Trump lost fascists get out. But if people want to put up a different sign, hate has no home here. I don't care. But put up a sign that rejects this. And then uh, at five o'clock on Wednesday, make a joyful noise, but a noise, pots and pans, sing a song, go play your Nina Simone and your impressions and whatever else, uh, you know, if Cornell was in Washington, he, he'd, he'd have some Motown coming out of his window. No. Okay. <laughs> but whatever Dang. it is, make a noise because we've got to start arousing people because if this takes root right now, we're going to have to de deal with it. And, and look, it's not over. They're planning, these fascists are planning to protest the entire time from the 17th up through the uh, inauguration, they're going to wreck a lot of havoc to be able to, what I said in my opening presentation, to be able to completely delegitimize this regime and prepare for a comeback to power and to actually intimidate and, and, and harass people. They have, sh they have killed, murdered people, young people of promise who stood with Black Lives Matter protests. They've murdered them with impunity and raised money for their defense. This is what this movement is. And not only has Biden committed the crimes you've said in the past, but that he's actually trying to reach across the aisles. And this is going to this is not going to work. And it's going to it's creating it's doing a lot of damage right now. So people do need to speak from the pulpit. They do need to speak from the street corners. They do need to speak, as we have done today on the radio and to sell people the truth about this. This is fascism. This is not just some psychopath. This is a, and being a psychopath, as I said, for four years is not a disqualification for being a fascist leader. It's actually a job requirement. And Donald Trump does pass that job requirement with shining colors. So we have to, we have to do everything we can do now to, to mobilize people and to prepare them for the struggle against this fascist move that's being made now and to prepare them for the kind of struggles that are going to need in the future. We need to have continued dialogue about the role of religion and the role of, uh, of, of secularism and science in changing the world. And we should recognize that that is not the main thing we're fighting amongst ourselves. It's a discussion to have, but people who have a largeness of mind and a generosity of spirit, who have a, a sense of, uh, of what you're calling a love of humanity and justice, we're on the same side, okay? 
we need to rally all the decent people and then have the kind of atmosphere where we struggle things out with each other without rancor, without anything ad hominem and say, look, what's true, what's not true. And, and if, if your beliefs lead you to fight injustice, I'm with you. And I believe, and I think this is something I've learned from Bob Avakian, that most of the people who take part in a revolution, if and when there is the revolution in this country, will be religious. And, and, and we will be standing with them. And then there'll be a struggle and a discussion in a new society that allows for that kind of struggle and discussion. We will be promoting science, but we will be able to struggle together. And people, will, people have to voluntarily change their beliefs. The idea of any coercion of people to change their beliefs has never worked and it won't work. Mm -hmm. There is a role for coercion in society. That's why we fought for civil rights. No, you can't, you can't segregate your schools. I'm sorry, you can't do that. Of course, they're fighting to reinstitute that. That kind of coercion is good coercion, where you pass a law and say, no, you can't discriminate against our le gay and lesbian and trans brothers and sisters. That's, that, that's a form of coercion, okay? But trying to change people's beliefs, people have to come to the change their beliefs. That's a big part of, of the kind of atmosphere we need right now. A big debate between reform and revolution needs to go on over the next, next period of time so we can figure out how do we get free of this mess? This is, you know, I, I'm, 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 on a, I'm on a soapbox now, but, but oh, when I but think you, about you, the hundreds of thousands of people who are needlessly wishy. dying right now and these assholes who are going out here saying that their freedom is to go infect people is a manifestation of and a product of an individualist, avaricious, competitive, predatory system that is called capitalism. And it may be in a new new form of liberalism, neoliberalism, but it's no different than what capitalism has ever been in its fundamental nature, and it needs to be overthrown, and we'll get to a different system that will at least allow mm -hmm. us to go to work on the problems mm -hmm. we face mm -hmm. and not stand in the way of it. Oh, absolutely. But I think at the same time, though, brother, that we have to be able to defend scientific analysis, even as we acknowledge how science has been co-opted, not just by capital, but it's co-opted to tell white supremacist lies about peoples of color and black male supremacist lies about women. The last thing you want is just line up scientists and thinking that somehow they're going to tell the truth. You can go to economic departments and physics departments all across the country. They got government contracts and in the name of science, they're telling all kinds of lies. It's ideology. Now, we have to be able to draw a distinction between that kind of ideology, even in its scientific forms and science, which is truth telling. And, and so in that sense, I think we, 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 we have to be able to acknowledge how commodification is ubiquitous. It co-opts everything, the churches, the psych psychologists, the physicists, the doctors, the lawyers, people on the street, folk in the barbershop, they all get spoon fed with these lies, you see. Now, and science is one of the fundamental ways in which you can puncture those lies. There's no doubt about it. But so is love-centered witness. Now, you could say, well, is love-centered witness scientific? I don't give a damn what we call it, but that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm committed to. <laughs> you see, when Sansara's out there on the street and, and they, they try to kill her and tell lies about her, She's being more than scientific in terms of an analysis. She's putting her body on the line. That's, that's, that's kenosis. That's emptying of herself in the form of a love that's for the people. She don't have to do that. She can kick back. She got a zillion other things to do. So it's that coming together. I mean, you know, I know Brother Vickian talks about this in terms of how the, mor the morals becomes tied to the scientific in that way. But that's also what I mean by also having a particular space for those of us who hold on to religious stories and narratives that render agents in those narratives worthy of a certain kind of following, whatever it is. Now, when you talked about Jesus being individuated, that's part of the attempt to separate him from his Jewishness. Exactly. How which is anti-Jewish. Right. How the, you know, that he you, sits at the center of the worst of Christendom. Oh, yeah. to somehow to think that he's some 
Hellenized X. No, the brother comes out of the Judaic tradition in the most fundamental way. He speaks out of Isaiah and so forth and so on, right? But he's also making an intervention in prophetic Judaism, which always has a sense of community. Yes. It's just that his community now is broader than just Jews, and it's focusing on the least of these, having a priority. But now, Doc, you raised in, in Luke 4, after Jesus comes into the synagogue and says, listen, right. um, there were a lot of widows, but the only one that God broke a piece off was the one in Zarephath. There were a lot of lepers, but the only one that God broke off a little bit was Naaman the Syrian. And the people in the church said, we gonna kill you. And the way that I envision that, he's at his home synagogue. So, so Andy Sansara, the people he grew up with, his Sunday school teacher, the person he went to the prom with, people he played basketball with, they said, because you have said that God is universal and is not our property, you must die, right? So we gotta understand that that, that impulse, like the gospels are dangerous documents, which is why the church makes sure we don't read them, right? Well, that, well, that kind of scientific reading of the biblical scripture itself. Yes. Now, but he does invoke Isaiah because yes. see, I would argue that even Judaism, and this is what Rabbi Heschel understood, has a universalism. Yes. See, the Amos 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 critique of Israel is the same as Amos's critique of the other nations. Exactly. So that it, it, it comes out of a particular tradition, but it's gonna hold for everybody across the board. So Jesus in that sense, like Hillel and some of the other Jewish brothers, and we of course the sisters, you know Esther and what have you. You, you got patriarchy that was that's quite, quite uh, uh, ugly there. And this is true in thick. Judaism. It's very thick, very thick. In Christianity too, Christianity too, Islam too. It is. Too. It I mean, is. You know. it is. Oh, yeah. I used to go around. You know, I used to go around when I was um, doing when Avakian published Away With All Gods, Unchanging, Unchaining the Mind and Radically Changing the World. Mm -hmm. I did a speaking tour. I went to campuses, uh, churches. I went all over the place um, speaking and promoting that book. And one of the things that I would do is I would challenge people to open the page, to open the Bible to any page. And if you read it in full, can we find patriarchy on that page? I never failed to find patriarchy on a single page of the Bible. And that doesn't mean that there aren't people who can find traditions within it to draw from who are fighting right. against patriarchy. Right. No, that's but I'm just saying, I'm, I'm uniting with the, you read it in its historical context, it was written Absolutely. by people who, who right. owned, men owned women and, and they wrote that into the scriptures. Um, but let me, and the myths they created, but I wanted to go back, if you don't mind, I'm going to, Go back to something you said, Cornell, which I want to maybe tease apart because you said science has been used to it, look. It was science that created the atom bomb. That was an, an atrocity, a crime against humanity. There's science can be used. Science has not got any morality to it. In it just is. Science is a tool for understanding reality as it actually is and how right. it could be. It's a reality-based, evidence-based method. Then you have to make a moral choice. What do you do with that? And that is actually what Avakian has done is, is taken really the, the partisanship comes in. Where do you stand after you discover the truth? Not, it doesn't, you don't bring it in and say, I'd like this to be true. Let me go line up the facts <laughs> to support it. You go, what's okay. true? What's true, even if it makes us uncomfortable, even if it creates a, even if it is a problem in the short term or long term that's difficult to overcome. You have to look at what actually is and then you decide what to do about it. Who do you stand with? For whom and for what? Is it for the 8 billion or for yourself? Is it for emancipation or something short term besides that? But there's, you don't stand a chance if you don't deal with what actually is true. Is if you don't understand right? what you're up against. So what I wanted to just pose to tease apart is you made the point, and I think it's true, there are many times science has been used for atrocity, and then there's been bad science, the science Absolutely. of race. Well, good science will tell you there is no such thing as race. That's actually deeper reality. That That's said, right. I just wanna, you made a point that, you know, if you line up all the scientists and say, trust them, you'll be in a world of hurt. I agree. However, if you actually demystify science and you give everybody the tools of that, then they're not subject to the 
experts. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to experts in their field. I, I think you should, you should learn sure. from them. But sure. the point is not trust the scientists. The point is everybody should have the method and the critical abilities to evaluate for themselves. And that's a difference between saying scientists are always right and science is a method that everybody can access to understand the world and change it and to contribute to that collective process with an objective standard that you're measuring it against where you can sort that out. And then it's a bigger discussion. I think there is science involved in mm -hmm. the certitude, the moral certitude of standing up against oppression and injustice rooted in the idea that the reality-based the conviction that is rooted in the reality that this is not the only way the world could be, that there's actually something worth standing up for because it's not inevitably going to be this well, way. But you could imagine a ruling class accepting an analysis that Brother Andy was for, mm -hmm. or that you or Brother Carl Dix or, or uh, 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 Brother Vakian. The ruling class can read that and say, I accept the analysis. Mm -hmm. It goes against my interest. I'm going to do everything That's I can true. to shut these folk down. They mm -hmm. speaking the truth, but they moving in a different direction. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah, and that's so, where the choice comes in. That, that's exact. So there's some irreducible something, something, something. It's hard to say exactly what it is, but there's a certain orientation toward the preciousness of the masses versus the orientation of greed individualism, even when they accept it. Because a lot of times you can get some serious class analysis from the Wall Street Journal, more so than the mushy neoliberal journal. But they know exactly where they're headed, given their greed, their blindness, and their callousness and indifference toward the suffering of poor people. Well, we've so, made the point, we've made I the point, Cornell, many times that um, if you don't have a fire in the belly for revolution, a fire in the belly against injustice, a fire in the belly for those who are suffering, a fire from belly for all those around the world, you can't be a revolutionary. And where does that fire come from? Where does that the, fire come from, though, brother? Well, it does, it does come from a deep moral sense. It Absolutely. does come from that moral sense. It comes from Absolutely. empathy. But Absolutely. here's the problem and why I brought, why I brought up, uh, you know, some of the things that had happened in the past in, in, in revolutionary movements, uh, particularly in some of the national liberation struggles in Latin America and South America uh, and, and in Africa, and also with problems in the communist movement. That deep sense of morality does have to be, at a, comes up against needing to be informed by a, a scientific understanding of the world. And yes, good science Absolutely. and mistakes can be made. Mistakes Absolutely. can be made and they will be made. It'll, mistakes will be made, but on a basic theoretical plane, what what Avakian has done is he's put communism on a more scientific basis. He's not starting from the individual proletarians, the individual workers. He's starting from the objective interests of a whole class of people, and he's 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 de developed the kind of understanding that Sansara was just talking about. You know that you you you. Um, you have to understand the nature, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's getting late. You have to understand the nature of the problem you're facing and the way forward through that and be able to move that process forward in such a way that people uh, who don't, that people are brought along with it without giving the whole thing up, to put it that way. That's, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm searching for words because I'm trying not to, I'm actually trying to not uh, open up a whole it, discussion it, it, on that. Maybe we can have another discussion, right. another discussion about. Right, brother, you got, you know, there's an objective reality. There's truth about it. You got to be able to know how to dance on that tightrope in such a way to hit it at the right moment, to make sure you listen to other voices and make sure your voice is put forward, not just an echo. And then make sure you have a collectivity that's trying to do what? change the world. Coltrane is blowing to change the world. You don't blow Love Supreme just to be blowing Love Supreme. The Love Supreme is not in the horn. It's not even in the music. It's the impact of the music on the people. You changing the world. Now let's call it jazz like, is that call it scientific, moral, it's got the science on the one hand, got morality on the other. Then here come jazz folk on the tightrope. 
Well, you know, you see, Cornell's playing a trick right now. He he knows that that I that I that we had a whole long walk on a march, and we talked about Coltrane. We talked about Coltrane, and, 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 and brother Andy, he got and, deep understanding. Now, brother Andy got to understand. Uh, okay, so you, I'm brother with Carl you on Coltrane. I'm with you on Coltrane, but the, the but still the question is, you know that. Uh, the, 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 there is a fundamental question here, and I do, I do want to come back to this point of uh, that one of the key breakthroughs of what is a breakthrough in the science of communism and revolution is that there is objective truth, that there's truth should not be an instrument of your, this is what Sansara was talking about, truth is not an instrument of your desired objectives, it just is true. And that even the worst truths about our past history, some of you have brought out some of the history within the church that you're not happy with and, and think was wrong. And we've, we, we confront, we're not afraid of the mistakes, even the terribly grievous mistakes that our movement has made, because if we go there, we can understand where they came from and how to overcome them. And the Absolutely. second thing that's a very important principle in what he's brought forward and that we emphasize a great deal is this point about the ends and the means. Mm -hmm that our means have to be consistent with our ends. Yes. And this yes. viewpoint that is okay, you know, that you hear from these charlatan philosophers like Zizek, that uh, uh, Slava Zizek, that, you know, you want to make an omelet, you got to break eggs, and you're speaking about people's lives, no. Revolution is going to be, uh, is not, a, you know, as Mao said, it's not a dinner party, it's a serious endeavor. And so every life in that situation is precious, even as you understand that lives are lost all the time to this system unnecessarily. And they're lost by being killed, by being forced into being refugees over up, soon to reach 100 million a year. And they're also being lost in terms of the creative, creative potential of the hundreds of millions of people mm -hmm. who never get to work with their minds, who never get to contribute to society. This is a tremendous waste of human potential that we could overcome. And so you need to understand this scientifically. This is a big breakthrough and it does connect up them with the morality of no, the means do not justify the ends. That is a Absolutely. capitalist ethos. It comes up at the beginning of capitalism actually. So listen, I think this immediate thing though is we do have to put our minds to um, and our hearts to uh, over the next several days uh, including I'll probably want to call both of you, if it turns out that we start seeing on Thursday, this is getting uh, additional legs, I can, we, we're not going to take the time to make the legal arguments that they don't have enough votes right now, that, that, two, uh, that they will protract this if they take the two hours mandated in the law the, uh, to discuss each contested state, they should still be uh, 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 a, a situation where it comes to a vote and it probably won't pass the... Uh, the either chamber that the election uh, is invalidated. Um, on the other hand, you know, if there is, is an article in New Yorker that if this is protracted over five days, then uh, it nullifies the uh, it nullifies the uh, electoral college, and then it's it goes to the House of Representatives, where each state gets one vote, and uh, the Republicans have 26 states, I believe. So, th th these these are. We have to see if that takes root, we're going to have to have some very serious discussions on, on Wednesday or Thursday. The people who signed the Refuse Fascism Pledge of Resistance, yourself, Cornell, and, and, and Reverend Lamar, we're going to have to discuss this. And some of us are going to have to take a stand and call forward those millions. I, I, I know they're not ready to... They're not ready to come, but they might be ready to come if they yeah. actually understood what yeah, was in front true. of them. And that's, and that's where these signs, this bring the noise, it's... You know, it's it's. I think what we're doing right now, this conversation we had on the radio earlier, can affect things. But it, this is this is serious business. If it doesn't come to that, we're going to have to figure out the ways in which we can come together and and continue the fight against this uh, uh, fascist movement, which is not going away. It's going to create a great deal more uh, uh, a strife. It's it's it, out of power, out of presidential power. Let's not forget that they actually run the court, the federal courts now from the Supreme Court all the way down. And they run many, most of the state houses. They run quite a bit of this country is actually under the under the rule of these people. So that struggle is going to continue. And we should be discussing the ways in which uh, you know we can talk about a radically different world, the, the world that you envision through your faith, 
and the world that we envision through our approach to um, a whole new uh, socialist society in this country, a genuine social society that is aimed at the emancipation of humanity all over the world, not just $15 an hour for Americans, but the emancipation of humanity here and around the world, and that those who are our brothers and sisters in Bangladesh are just as precious as those, as you Absolutely. would say, Cornell, in South Central. Or, Absolutely, or in, brother. Uh, no, north side of uh, Washington, D.C., or here in South, uh, South Central L.A. I'll tell you one thing that, that, that is helpful to me and has been helpful to the people that I serve. We spent years just thinking of, through the politics of interpretation. Who benefits from the way you think about religion? Who benefits from the way you think about economics and politics? And that slow work intellectually in our church and other communities, that really was transformative, asking that question and then showing other ways of knowing, other ways of thinking. And when people can juxtapose and be clear that there is that every scrap of information you get is politicized. Those who give it to you, give it to you with an end in mind, and that is to order the world in a certain way. Those who taught us history in high school, grade school, they wanted the world to be ordered in a certain way. And, mm -hmm. and, and when I was able to work with folks to peers, so that, I think that we, we have to keep thinking theoretically, but also thinking, how do we have conversations with everyday people, as, as, as Dr. West talks about, that helps them to see? Because, I mean, no one is at peace in this reality. People are, people are not at peace, they're not at peace. And how do you then have the conversation so that the scales, you can't, in, in, you know, I can't take the scales off of your eyes, but we can have conversations so that our scales fall together. And so, you know, absolutely, we have to keep thinking. Absolutely. About, have to keep thinking about this. I think it's amazing to me how, you know, and I think of two giants, yourself and uh, Brother Barber, William Barber, Somehow both of y'all got through Duke in your right mind <laughs> with the fire inside of your souls. It's hard. With the same it's hard. kind of backbone that we've been talking about all this time. And it, 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 you know, you too, you really stand out and, and outstanding in terms of uh, the prophetic traditions of any religion, let alone Christianity, let alone black Christianity in that way. That's a fascinating, it's a fascinating connection. And what Brother Andy's talking about is, give us a call in the next day or two. You got my number through Brother Carl Dix. And of course, we send in our love, respect to Sister LaVette, like I don't know what. But uh, you all make contact with us in the next day or two. We, 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 we check it out and see what's going on in Washington, D.C. Because uh, you think about you know the impact of the uh, presence in the New York Times. And it goes back five years. And then five years later, there it is again. And people think, who is this refused fascism? What, what are they talking about fascism? I heard so-and-so talking about, I heard you talk about it, Brother West. You call him a neo-fascist gangster for five years. I think they're going too far. He's not fascist. He's just somebody you disagree with. Hey, get off the crack pipe. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't using this language just haphazardly. And it was really the refused fascist movement in which Revolutionary Communist Party's analysis, vision, sacrifice, service, led very much by Sansara in the streets, and then with Brother Andy and Carl, and then Brother Vicky and Steary, has really put fascism on the map for the last five years. And that needs to be said. And it's very important, and, and I hope we get this link because I'm gonna put this on my Facebook and my uh, and my Twitter. You know what Beautiful. I mean? So they get a chance to listen to the different voices in this regard as it relates to both fascism, what happens in the next few days, the relation of religion, prophetic religion to revolutionary struggle, the role of science, all the good stuff, and the wonderful laughter, and a little bit of the cold train and arts and uh, Curtis Mayfield and things. Nina Simone that we get, we get in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I was told, Cornell, I was told not to do this because <laughs> I put this on this morning and they said, no, don't you go do something corny like this, but there's Nina. 
<laughs> oh, that's it right there. That's it right there. Oh, I'm giving both of y'all a hug. Oh, y'all okay. A hug. Okay. I mean, I was told not to do it. That was just too corny. You know but, how to get uh, Andy to do something <laughs> is you tell him not to do it. And, you know, it's almost a guarantee. Oh, I like the, Andy, I like no, the color. I got it as a gift. And I said, I, got, I just can't just go on the black shirt because they'll think I got the same suit on as Cornell. So I put on a yellow t shirt. <laughs> But I, but since you mentioned since you mentioned it, I I, I thought I would oh, show no, you. Oh no, we love it. No, because what 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 is our movement without the artist? Well, listen, you guys. All um, I have to say this has been it it is it has been a joy, it has been an honor and a privilege to talk with all three of you and 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 so gracious of you all to stick around and stay for the after conversation. I will definitely send everybody the link. Please spread it, and if you're watching online spread it to your friends your family put it on your social media this conversation needs to get out i mean there really are i have no doubt at all and we've seen it even in the numbers that voted against trump there are so many millions who are agonized right now absolutely they are paralyzed but it's and and we've seen this everywhere we've been and i've seen it in the streets we've gotten reports from the refused fascism chapters that have done phone banking to people we've gotten this in many different ways there's a there's a passivity, but there's a lot of ang deep anxiety underneath it and fear and concern. And I think if the if this conversation and the others that, that we do at the Revolution Nothing Less show um, could get out much more broadly, I think there'd be some connection. We'd be forging more of that community that people need to overcome and to find their courage, find their best side and get out there in the streets together, learn from each other, strengthen each other and, and have the arguments we need to have going forward. So I just, I wanna thank you, Dr. Cornell West for coming on the, uh, we only want the world show on the radio and revolution, nothing less show here on YouTube. Um, Reverend William Lamar, it's, it's just a great honor to have you with us. And I want to spend a, send a special um, piece of all of our hearts to you and to your church tomorrow, oh, even yeah. tonight with these proud boys coming there. That, that was such that a, cool. a, a piercing atrocity. What was done to your church and Asbury church and everybody should be watching your church and having your back right now. And I thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much. And Andy, it is always a joy and a pleasure to, to I, I talk to you almost every day. We work so closely together. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm glad to be sharing the, the conversation with all of you. So thank you so much. You did a thank you. Uh, it's a, been a, tr a tremendous experience to be with both of you and to uh, to be with you again, Cornell, and to meet uh, Reverend Lamar. Uh, and again, be strong. And and we're going to be with you the next two days. And Sansar, you did a, a just a really beautiful job and created an, an atmosphere and and focused Absolutely. the discussion and kept it going. Thank I think you. It's, it's you know really was was fantastic. And so. Um, I appreciate this greatly, and hopefully, people I echo you that this should get out. People should see it. People should should get into it, and and the and the struggle continues. And so does the not just the struggle against the enemy, but the struggle in the realm of ideas and thinking and morality among ourselves. That's that's so important. And anybody who denigrates it has not understood anything about what what's necessary to change the world. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. Uh, we thank we, we thank you all. We thank all right. you all. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's magnificent.